pleasure of working at one of the coolest places on Earth that explores outside our planet, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So his That's debut fun. novel, The Scout, is a page-turning sci-fi thriller. This morning, he is here to talk about adapting screenplays into novels and vice versa, and it's my supreme pleasure to welcome Mr. Eric Posse. Thank, Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is fantastic to see you here. I just want to do a quick survey in the room and just see who here uh, is a screenwriter. Okay, several. Uh, novelists. Wow, a lot of novelists. Cool. Um, both. People that are, that are writing both. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, film people, film producers, directors, in the back. Great. Awesome. Okay, great. We're going to great things today. So, I'm going to be touching on, we're going to, I'll talk about screenplay to novel, novel to screenplay. Um, I'll be emphasizing a little bit more the screenplay to novel because that's kind of been my own, my own journey as a writer here in recent years, but I'm going to try to cover a lot and there's not a lot of time. First of all, let me just tell you, we have a, I have a giveaway. I'm going to, um, if you, when you came in, if you had a chance to uh, sign your name and email on a card, we're going to do a drawing later and I will personalize and sign a copy of my debut novel, Scout. This book was heavily inspired by my, my time at JPL. I was a television producer, documentary filmmaker for the Mars rover missions, so I covered uh, Curiosity Mars rover, the Phoenix Polar Lander, and also the Spirit and Opportunity Twin Rover missions. And um, it, was a, it was a big decision in my life to transition from screenwriting to novelization, and it really came out of having worked at JPL and, and starting to learn about planetary exploration. So anyway, sign up for that, so I'll print a copy of that, and then I'm also going to give away a Kindle, as a, as a second prize, a Kindle ebook copy of the Apocalypse Weird novel, Phoenix Lights. It's an alien invasion thriller. Apocalypse Weird is a new book series. By Wonderman Media, there are approximately 12 books that are already released in the series. Um, this one's going on sale next week uh, for 99 cents on ebook, and um, we've got some published authors with major publishers involved in this project, and some indies. In fact, Weston Oaks, if you all know who he is, he's got a book in the Apocalypse Weird Universe that just landed like last week. So, anyway, so those are coming up, and. All right, so anyway, a little bit about myself. Um, I make my living primarily as a commercial and film editor and a visual effects artist, and uh, I started writing screenplays straight out of high school. I, I became very interested in filmmaking as a kid. If you ever seen the movie Super 8, that literally was me as a kid with a Super 8 camera shooting my friends in monster masks and blood and you know cutting it together on a little eight millimeter splicer with the cement and all that. And um, so after high school, I just decided that, you know, I'm going to learn how to write because this is just, this is how you get movies made. You write movies, you sell them, and you get your movies made, and that's how it works. So, uh, so I took the plunge into that. I was very fortunate to find a literary agent a couple years later and shopped around and got optioned a couple times. And as I will sort of explain in my journey later on, came to a point where I had, I had to make a decision as a writer in terms of my long-term goals. What did I want to do? Do I want to keep writing screenplays or do I want, I, I, I love writing. How do I make, how do I use that love? How do I keep, continue on that path uh, without getting frustrated if something's not getting produced? So I'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, and uh, on the film side, I was involved in two adaptations and I'll, I'll touch on those a little bit. One was the Stephen King uh, short film Paranoid based on his poem from his book Skeleton Crew. Um, and then the other one was Ray Bradbury's Kaleidoscope, the second story from The Illustrated Man. I did a film adaptation of that and uh, we did a whole bunch of film festivals with, with Kaleidoscope. So anyway, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, the gallery, you see these are these are books, these are work that I've, I've written. Uh, the two novels, Phoenix Lights, The Scout. The Tales of Tinfoil is an anthology. Uh, editor David Gaywood invited me to contribute a story. It's, it's, it's all about conspiracy theories and sort of the re dark reimagining of conspiracy theories. So since I'm the JPL guy, he asked me to do a moon landing story. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I have a fake filmmaker who's shooting you know, the footage that's going to air you know, during the landing. But there is a real landing. So the way I set the story up is, 
they're shooting this fake footage, but they really are landing for another reason. So uh, that's a cool one. Synchronic, the time travel anthology. Uh, that book actually hit the top 20 in the Kindle store last summer. In one of the top 20 books, and it's, it's still selling like Game of Thrones. Okay. So let's talk about uh, adapted material uh, because this, you know, for myself, you go to the movies and anymore, it, it almost seems like not every time, but I'm just noticing there's just the percentage of work that is adapted from other material to film is, is pretty staggering. So I found this statistic in this book, Reading the Movies by William Costanzo, notes that it's been estimated that 35% of all films ever made were adapted from novels. And if you count other literary forms, stage drama, articles, short stories, that estimate might well be 65%. I, I believe that's probably true. I think that's probably true. Um, that says a lot about um, where they find source material for movies. Um, in fact, uh, it was funny the other day I was going through this list and uh, did everyone here know that Die Hard, the original, was adapted from a novel? Yeah, a few people, yeah. But, but, but seriously, uh, Roderick Thorpe's book called Nothing Lasts Forever. And uh, I remember seeing that in the theater and uh, it was, that was sort of in the background, but I came back to that and I'm like, wow, that was adapted from a book, you know? It's pretty cool. So, um, so this is, this is interesting. You just kind of see where all this source material comes from. Um, popular and successful film adaptations. I mean, here's a partial, I mean, this is a, this is a sliver of the films, but you know, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, Twilight, Jaws, Jurassic Park. Um, that movie, The Most Dangerous Game, apparently has been adapted about 19 times over the last some years. Shrek, Lord of the Rings, Blade Runner, Silence of the Lambs. Some of these are from short stories, some are from books. Um, Forrest Gump, I didn't realize that was from a book. The Graduate, Princess Bride, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and the list goes on and on. So you can really see that not only uh, are, are the statistics very high that people are adapting material, but obviously they're very successful. There's a, there's a whole lot of them that are extremely successful commercially and very popular. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about adopting novels and screenplays uh, to start with. And um, is there anyone in the room that is currently adapting a novel? First of all, let me, let me ask, let me say that somebody else's novel to a screenplay for a producer or for a studio or anything like that. Okay, is anyone adapting their own novel to a screenplay? Yes? Okay, so a few people. Okay, cool. All right. So, actually, let me ask you guys a question. Hey, um, what's your genre of the book that you're adapting? Uh, young adult drama. Young adult drama? Mine's young adult fiction. Okay. Well, I'm going the opposite thing. Right. Adopting a science fiction screenplay, time travel, romance, action, <coughs> to novel form. Okay. Yep, and I'm going to talk about that next. Okay. So let's just, let's just talk a little bit about this. Okay, novels and screenplays, they are, they, there are, um, there are differences. <laughs> and it, it, it's obvious there are differences, but let's just talk a little bit about them. So for length, obviously novels are not bound by any prescribed length, and screenplays are. Screenplays are very, very precise. If you've ever been read at an agency or gotten, you know, um, a read-through or a producer read it, they're, they're extremely, unless you're James Cameron, you can write a 200 page screenplay. <laughs> for the rest of us, it's, you know, 120 is the max. I mean, that is like, if you're, if even at 120, you're, you're kind of pushing your luck. Um, and novels, of course, there, there's no such thing. I, I was in uh, Barnes & Noble about a week ago and, you know, picked up George R. R. Martin's Storm Swords. It's, 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 a thousand pages. it's like heavy, my back. It's like, it's difficult just to pick it up. So, uh, Stephen King's um, Under the Dome, a thousand pages. You know, and even just thinking about how would you adapt something that prodigious down to a, you know, in the screen. Obviously they did it as a mini-series, but we're, we're talking about film here, okay. So, that's a huge difference. The hero's journey in a novel may be largely internal and relational with limited external forces. And I'm, I'm talking more about literary fiction, where it's a little bit more stream of consciousness, it's more character-driven, it's more about what the character is feeling, what they're experiencing, the people in their lives, you know, how they interact with other characters, 
uh, with themes and things like that, but not so much, let's say, a very precise plot. So, and these are these are things that I want you to think about if you're going if you're going to adapt a book into a screenplay. Be cognizant of these things because it, it can be easy to sort of let it inflate and kind of grow because there are so many wonderful things in a book, but the, the cinematic experience is a different it's a different mechanism. I mean, you obviously you want to preserve the theme, the heart, the, the soul of the work, but in bringing it into film, it, it's it's going to it's changing forms, but you still want to preserve its heart and its soul. Okay, so it's, it helps to if you are going to do an adaptation to really analyze the book and realize is it genre fiction or is it literary fiction? Genre fiction uh, tends to be a bit more plot driven. Uh, where you really do have a, something that's a bit more similar to a screenplay in terms of the beats, the setups, the payoffs, the act breaks. It might be a little bit more of that than, let's say, literary fiction. Um, the struggle for a movie hero lead character must primarily be a visible one that ties to, an, like an umbilical cord, to an internal one. And the emphasis is on the visible while still addressing the internal. So I'll give you an example, Die Hard. Um, the external um, struggle is Hans Gruber taking Nakatomi Plaza hostage and all the hostages and, and John McClane's wife. That's the external struggle. It's to stop Gruber and his men and, and, to, and to stop the, the robbery. The internal one is to fix his failing marriage. You know, his wife, his, his estranged wife, Holly, is taken uh, hostage by Gruber. So now not only does he have to defeat Gruber and these guys, but he has to redeem the marriage, save his wife, and essentially save his marriage. So you've got these two things. You've got the external and the internal, and they both get addressed, but the beauty is they all kind of come back together in a single solution, and they get solved by the end of the, end of the film. So I use that as an example for adapting the book to the screenplay, and the screenplay was very precise in that. It's a, it's a wonderful, I actually have a copy of uh, the Sousa's script on the shelf. Um, so yeah, books. Uh, most successful adaptations are based on books that already have a well-defined story concept, and the movie should have a strong resemblance to the source material in respect to themes and tone. And great film adaptations, this is the key, preserve the spirit and the themes of the book, but turn them into a cinematic experience. So that's the difference. You're, you're, you're translating. You're not, um, it still holds true. I know sometimes, you, you hear people say, well, I saw the movie, the movie was terrible, the book is way better. I would, you know, I would agree with that sometimes. I mean, it's clear the books are, you know, I love books, and, uh, but there have been some great adaptations to it. can be done, but, you know, there's, there's a certain respect for the material and understanding of these things of genre fiction and uh, literary fiction to consider if you're going to adapt, if you're going to adapt from book to screenplay. So I'm going to talk about these two adaptations that I was involved with. Uh, Stephen King and Ray Bradbury. So the first one, Paranoid at Chant. How many people have read Paranoid? Okay, so I read this poem, you know, years ago when I was in high school, and um, what happened was my, a friend of mine who's a film director uh, shot a short film uh, of Paranoid, and so I came on as the film editor and cut it, and we, it, and once the film was done, he sent a VHS copy to Stephen King. And three weeks later, the phone rings, and his wife says, it's the phone for you, I think it's Stephen King. <laughs> and so, sure enough, uh, it was King, and he said, hey, I really like the film, what do you want to do with it? So I'd like to use it as sort of a demo for directing and cinematography. Long story short, Paranoid became one of King's dollar babies, one of the dollar angels, I don't know if you've heard about that, but he would, he would option to young filmmakers or up-and-coming filmmakers his, his material, uh, some of his material, for a dollar. And that would give the filmmaker certain rights to exhibit and, and distribute the film, just depending. So in the case of Paranoid, um, Paranoid went on to be featured on the Total Movies TV uh, back in 2003, I believe. Um, and it was written up in King's biography, The Essential Stephen King. They actually talked about this <coughs> adaptation. Uh, Ray Bradbury's Kaleidoscope. This was a film that I, I served as the film director. I also did visual, uh, some visual effects on it, and I worked with the producer in adapting this. And so I'm going to talk about what we did, how we adapted this material, because when you think Stephen King and Ray Bradbury, this isn't just anyone's book. These guys are, you know, 
they're up there. And so in both cases, it was a little sobering to think, wow, we really need to do this wrong. <laughs> because, you know, you, you really don't want to blast that up. So let me talk about a couple ways that we did it. So in Stephen King's um, short story, the narrator, you don't really know who it is. It's, it's never specified if it's a man or if it's a woman, how old this person may be. They're just, they're just on this paranoid rant about what's wrong with the world. It starts off very, very small, very sort of personal, like, you know, there are men have discussed me in back rooms when the phone rings, there's only dead breath. And then by the end of it, she's talking about, you know, they know how to put out the sun with blow guns. So the whole thing starts off with these sort of personal paranoia, and then it grows into these global conspiracies, and it becomes much more frantic. So in, in this adaptation, uh, director Jay Holman decided to cast a woman. And it was really interesting because, you know, reading the poem in my mind, I'm hearing it as a man, but when you, when you hear her say it, it, it just it, it just brought in a whole <coughs> dynamic. It was absolutely fantastic uh, the way it works. You can actually see the film online. It's on YouTube. The copy isn't that great. It looks like it was ripped from the Total Movies magazine DVD. <laughs> um, the film was originally shot in 35 millimeter, 2.35 to one, so it looks beautiful. But it, but the point is, if you want to see the film, you should take a look at it because that's a good example of adapting source material, especially a poem, which in some ways, like, how would you adapt a poem? But if you guys get a chance to see that, take a look at it and see how we did that. Now, Ray Bradbury's Kaleidoscope, this is a bit more challenging because in the short story, uh, these astronauts, this crew is on the ship coming back to Earth, the ship explodes and they're all thrown out into space, and in the story, they're in their spacesuits. So they're floating through space, in their spacesuits, helmets on, and they're talking to each other through these radios in their helmets, and they've only got a few hours of oxygen left, basically. They've got a few hours to reconcile. You get the idea that, that there's some bad blood between some of these guys, and they're sort of dealing with their issues as they're starting to <coughs> fall apart in space. So when we started talking about doing this film, it became clear, well, on our budget, uh, we're really not going to be able to hang our lead actor on wires for 12 hours a day and shoot him in, in a helmet, because really that's going to be, it just, you know, as a film, it's not going to look very good. So the, so the adjustment we decided to make was, instead of a space suit, we're going to put them in space pods. And that's the, uh, that, that pod over there, that's the actual 3D uh, model of using the film. So this way, we can have our actor sitting in a seat inside of the spacecraft doing things. And then, as you can see on the bottom panel here, he's able to talk with the other uh, the other crew in their pods through this video feed. So the great thing about that for film is that they can see each other, they can react to each other. So, you know, one of them's angry and the other one's, you know, uh, um, upset. Uh, this is, um, uh, that's Applegate, that's Lasper, and that's Simpson over here. And, and it created for a great interaction and it really helped us as in terms of getting the film, getting the thing shot in a way that was meaningful. Um, from the get-go, people who knew Ray very well told us, if you honor his material, and that's the key, honoring his material, he will love you, he will back you up, he'll love the film, and you'll be in great shape. So this was one adjustment we made. Um, but the other decisions we made, this story was published in 1949. So the language is very different. It's not like what you read in modern dialogue. So at one point, Lesper on the end there says, He's talking to Hollis Lee characters. He says, Hollis, he says, like, you know, there's something wrong with the phone. Can you boost your signal? And you know, the term phone in 1949, but you know, thinking space, it's still a phone. They're still talking. So we kept that in. We decided we're not going to modernize the language. We're going to keep the language from 1949, including the narration and the dialogue. So we preserved that. The only other thing we did was combine some characters, because I think in the story there's about eight or ten characters that, that sort of come into play, and we combined some of those characters just to simplify it. So it really boiled down to these three characters, Lesper, Applegate, <coughs> and Hollis, the lead guy, and then the captain's voice. You hear the captain's voice at one point. So we screened the film for Ray at his home, in January of 2012, and uh, <coughs> he absolutely he loved the film, loved it, uh, gave us his highest compliments, gave us his uh, big seal of approval, and we went out to the film festivals for about a year, year and a half. Uh, the last 
public screening of this film was last summer at San Diego Comic Con. But it was really true. By staying true to the book and just making a few of those um, adjustments to it, but really preserving the heart and the soul. Because the heart and the soul of Kaleidoscope is these men are going to die. They've got, you know, the, the oxygen's running out. Nobody's getting saved. There is no saving them. In fact, one of them's about to uh, crash through Earth's atmosphere and disintegrate policies. So what do you do with that? You reconcile your, 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 with, your, with your fellow man, you know? And so that's, we, we kept that, we preserved that, and, and consequently, I think the film works very well. So these are two cases of adapting material from, uh, from major authors to film. And uh, in both cases, they, they were both very successful, I'm happy to say, so. Um, all right, so let me, let me talk uh, about this, the novelizing your screenplay. And <coughs> if you're a screenwriter like me, and I, I've, I've met uh, many of them, um, where they just have a pile of scripts, you know, you write. In fact, I know a gentleman, a uh, guy in Los Angeles, who told me that he was writing a script one script per month for three years. And I mean, that's impressive, that's a lot of rights, very prolific, but it's like, yeah, but what are you gonna do with all that? You know, I mean, at some point, you sort of evaluate, like, wow, this is, you know, the stack's growing, and, and if those don't get produced, well, what do you do? You know, what do you do? As a writer, I asked myself that question. So this is my epiphany in 2011. Let's just tell you a quick story about this. Okay, so I've been writing screenplays for a long time. I had an agent, I was shopping, I got optioned a few times, close calls, and then, you know, it's like that horrible feeling of, oh, it just didn't quite, you know, come together. So I wrote a, a I started working at JPL uh, in 2007 for the Phoenix Polar Lander mission, and I started to learn about planetary exploration. And this is what really got me interested in the idea of re reversing this. Like, okay, so if an alien, uh, uh, race were sending out scouts to do environmental surveys, do planetary surveys on these worlds, these candidate worlds for something, how would they do it? You know? So I love the idea of extendable hardware and landing, and once it lands, what's it looking for? How is it acquiring the samples? How is it analyzing them? I wanted to get into all that, so I started to write a script because that's what I do. I'm a writer, I write a script, I don't, you know. So my default was to do that. And I finished this draft in 2009. I was, it was, it, I, I hated it. I was so dissatisfied with it. I just, it was like, oh, I, I, I want to get into the detail. I want to get into the breakdown of the expendable. I want to create a breadcrumb trail of flight hardware that the, that nobody really knows that this thing has landed, but they start to find flight hardware. They find a heat shield. They find ballast. They find a back shell, a parachute, and, and they start to put the pieces together. And the breadcrumb trail leads to the device which is a biomechanical geochemist. So I'm right, I'm trying to cram this into a script in 108 pages, and it just, it's, it's not working. It's just, I'm like, oh, this is, so I, I, I put it aside. I'm like, eh, I had a producer read it. He's like, yeah, you should fix this and just do a rewrite. I'm like, I don't want to do a rewrite. So I, I shelved it. So about two years, so in 2011, right before the Curiosity Mars rover launch in November, um, I'm sitting at home, and this, this story is just still germinating. It's like, what do I do with this? And then it just, it, it's weird. It's like that light bulb moment where suddenly the light bulb goes on, and I think, well, maybe I should just write it as a book, you know? Um, and suddenly the light bulb went on. So now I sit down, and instead of opening Final Draft and writing Exterior Space, you know, I write Chapter 1, Prologue, and I start to write. So. This for me was a, was a, a big epiphany because, um, as a writer, uh, you know, I had to ask myself some tough questions. It's like, what do I want as a writer? What do I really want in terms of a career? If I'm going to have a career at this, or if I'm even just going to do it, what do I want? I want a readership. I want people to read my work. You know, and it's tough when you're writing screenplays because, especially if you live in Los Angeles, because everybody has a screenplay. Right. You know, you tell a producer, like, you know, I'm working on a screenplay. like, yeah, you and everybody else. Um, and you really can't ask your cousins, your neighbors, your friends, hey, you want to read my script? It's like, they don't know what to do with that. I had people look at the format. They're like, I don't understand this. What is it? Is that dialogue? What's the parenthetical? Why, is it, why does it say X 
house at night. Like, they just didn't understand it. So um, I, I started to evaluate this. Now I want people to read my work. I have some stories that I want to tell, and I want people to, to step into that world. I want them to step in and, and go, through this, go through this journey. So that's what really, it, it was pivotal. So I just decided, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a different route here. So let me talk a little bit about the spec script market and sort of to illustrate my point. So going back to what we talked about earlier, that uh, you know, 65, let's just say 60, 65% of material is from uh, books, short stories, all these other things. So the spec script market, which is a script that you just sort of you know, you write, it's a spec. Um, uh, spec Scout, I looked this up, specscout.com. Uh, compiled said there's a total of 90 specs were sold in 2014. Okay, um, and I'm I, I would wager that those specs, at least most of them, were probably by writers that have already penned something for someone and have probably already sold something. Maybe not, but uh, there's a few. But um, and then if you count pitches, uh, the number goes to 148. So in light of that, there are tens of thousands of spec scripts that are written every year. So let's, let's be honest about it. It's tough. It's tough to sell a script, especially to a major studio or a major production company. It is. It's very, very difficult. Um, and it's not to be discouraging, but it's just to sort of confront the reality of the situation. And again, asking myself as a writer, is that what I want to keep doing? You know, maybe it will work out for me, but if it doesn't, is that, is that the only thing I want, or do I want to try and do something else? Okay. And by the way, just if you're interested, these are the genres. Uh, out of those, out of those sales. So you can see action, adventure in the lead, thriller, drama, sci-fi, fantasy, comedy, and horror. So screenplays are very precise. They they have to be very uh, precise in terms of their beats. There's approximately 60 beats uh, in a, in a screenplay. There's an act one, act two, act three. There's a midpoint. There's minor act breaks, major act breaks. But, but again, um, if you've ever had a script uh, um, read by someone at an agency, they're, they're incredibly brutal about your um, structure. I mean, they will kill you if, you know, if the act breaks aren't right, if the payoffs aren't, if everything isn't just so, uh, you just, you just, it feels like you get run over by a truck. So there's, so there's, a very, uh, there's a precision to a screenplay. That being said, if you've written a competent screenplay, you've got good structure, story beats, setups and payoffs, a satisfying ending and good characters, essentially you've got a very detailed outline for a novel. You've got a very detailed outline. I, I recommend outlining um, you know, to, to, to write a book. I've had it in the last two books, especially the Apocalypse book. I had to outline the heck out of that to make it work. Um, the novel is a much larger canvas than a screenplay. Okay, the length of a modern novel, and again, I, this is approximate, I've heard, at one point, three years ago, I heard it was 80,000 to 120,000, now I've heard it's 60, anywhere from 60, maybe 55 to 120, uh, and of course, if you're George R. R. Martin, it's about 350,000 <laughs> words. Um, um, but to use a film metaphor, you're no longer working in 720p, you're working in HD 4K IMAX. You know, you're, you're, the, the, the canvas has grown exponentially in terms of, of what you can do with your story. So, how do you fill that space? Let's say you have a great script, and it's occupying this, you know, this, this uh, real estate right here on the screen, but you need to grow it out to there. So how do you do that? How do we do that? Let's take a look. Uh, you want to grow without becoming dull. Because it could, you know, one of the traps could be that you add all this mass to it, but it, it's it's just sort of hot air. It's fat. It doesn't really serve the story. So I was thinking of an analogy. I'd say, you know, if, if you if you equate yourself exercising, right? Let's say your screenplay is 130 pounds, and you want to add 50 pounds of mass to your screenplay. Um, you know, you want it to be real mass, so what would you do? You go to the gym, you work out, you want the growth, but it still has the power, and it, it's efficient, it has power, but it, you still have the, the essence inside it, if that makes sense, okay? 
So I was going to give you an example of that, a, a specific example. So I took um, the, the first scene from my screenplay, The Scout, which I shelved. And we'll just read through this real quickly. And then I'm going to read you just the prologue that actually I grew out of this. OK, so very script format, exterior outer space. External vacuum, desolate, cold, yet lonely, with the brilliance of a billion shining stars. Slowly, one of those stars moves. It approaches us, not a star at all. It is, in fact, a moving craft, alien, cone-shaking the rear with a dark, armored front. It comes screaming toward us, engine blazing and cutting. It begins a slow turn, small thrusters firing. We pan with it, now seeing the massive blue curve of the Earth. Magnificent. The craft rocks toward the atmosphere, unflinching. Okay, typical screenplay speak. That's just establishing that there's an otherworldly presence, there's something that's coming to Earth. Okay. Um, now I'm going to read you uh, the prologue in the book. Because again, you know, working, <coughs> working uh, behind the scenes in the whole JPL thing, you just start to learn that there's so much more to it than that. You know, the objectives. It's like, well, how do I communicate the objectives? Like, why is this thing coming? <laughs> I mean, we've seen this a hundred million times. You know, there's an alien ship coming toward Earth. I mean, they've done that, you know, but it why is it coming, you know? <laughs> and, and so I wanted to start to explain a little bit in a prologue, like, what, what's going on? Something's waking up. This machine is waking up, and it's, it's got a purpose. It's starting to talk to itself about what's going to happen next. So this is what it came up with. It awoke gradually, powering up one system at a time as the computer program switched from flight to atmospheric entry. The journey had been long, though time seemed of little consequence inside the womb-like darkness of this thermally tuned environment. It was the distance, tens of billions of miles in the vacuum of interstellar space that presented considerable risk to the flight and ultimately the mission. But this phase of the journey had been successful and was nearly finished. Each system ran diagnostics that confirmed complete health across the board. Everything was in the green, all systems were stable. The risk shifted to the next phase of the mission, one of the most challenging. All of it began with an idea that evolved into a long-term project requiring ages of remote sensing aimed deep into the very heart of the galaxy. Candidate worlds were carefully surveyed for detailed information regarding surface composition and mineralogy, major surface modification processes, ages of surfaces, gross physical characterizations, and atmospheric conditions. But only a finite amount of data can be re re obtained remotely. Advanced surface operations were the only way to be sure that a world, any world, would be a fully viable candidate for the project. An alarm sounded in the dark, signaling a lock on the target planet ahead. The entry, descent, and landing sequence program loaded flawlessly. Everything was happening just as expected. And very soon, in just a few days, surface operations would begin on this candidate world that orbited a small yellow light star. So very good. Very good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give a little bit of, of background on this this isn't just a random landing this is very very uh, uh, specific this is very targeted um, the yellow white star a candidate well I didn't say third rock third planet <laughs> so it's like I, I actually looked up I was looking at stars and just categories of stars and it's like ours is a small it's like a G, a G class star thank you it's yellow white so I'm like okay I'm just gonna say that but do you see what I'm saying about growth inside of the parameters? You looked at the screenplay version first, and then you look at this. So I'm sort of inflating this, if you will, but I'm adding mass to it. But you, you know, the, again, at the same time, it, does, it can't just be hot air. It just can't be sort of like three pages. Of, oh, and the ship kept flying, and then it flew this way, and then it flew that way. But, but really, really, it's saying something. So it, as you start to um, grow your script into a book, think about ways that you're, you're again, had that concept of adding mass, but, but make it count so that you're not boring people. Um, keys to growth, so maintain your pace, don't lose your reader. Um, scripts, they always tell you this, um, I got told this, getting, getting into the scene late. So you basically, it's, it's if you were you know, walking into a room and suddenly two people are screaming at each other or somebody's got a gun or whatever, and it's like, oh man, what's going on here? But that instantly gives you something to grab hold of, like, okay, what's going on? I want to know what's happened. Something's gone on in this room, and now I'm walking into this. What is this? So this is one thing I practiced in, this, in my book was, as a, as a film editor and as a screenwriter, is getting into the scene late when something's already going on. 
and then getting out of the scene early while there's still tension or conflict is high. Um, and I, I, for me personally, um, I try to finish with action, conflict, or revelation. Like it's something, so, something clicks. Uh, somebody comes to an epiphany about something, or there's action, or there's conflict. And giving the reader, a, the reader a darn good reason to come back to the next chapter. Um, these seem like no-brainers, but you, but sometimes um, you know I, I've I found some things where it does sort of um, it starts to fizzle out. It, it's that thing of growth where there's too much hot air, there's not enough, and so just be cognizant of this. Don't lose your pace, don't lose your focus, and don't give people a reason to to jump out of the page. Um, I actually heard a, a gentleman tell me he. He's, uh, he told me Shane Black, I don't know if you guys know who Shane Black is, a screenwriter, right? From Lethal Weapon, Iron Man 3, right? Okay. Um, he said that when he wrote uh, Lethal Weapon, the script, and I actually have a copy of Lethal Weapon on my, on my shelf as well, he said, <laughs> Shane actually told this guy, he said, yeah, I said, I, um, I worked really hard to format the script so that at the bottom of every single page there was a cliffhanger. Like, he literally, like, some of the pages, like, a third of the page is blank. But, right before it goes blank, you know, Riggs kicks down the door, draws his gun, dot, dot, dot. It's like, well, of course I gotta turn the page. It's like, what's next? So it made sure that, like, every single page of that script was just, like, it gave you a reason you have to come back and read. And I would say, think about doing the same thing in your book. Give them a reason to come back, end the, 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 the chapter with a bang with something. It's like, oh. You know, now what? Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I feel like there are two huge impressions you can make in a book. Um, is how it starts, the feeling people have as they step into your world from the very beginning. What's the first thing that they read, the very first thing, and how it ends, how they feel when they read your last sentence. Yeah, I mean, literally your last sentence. Like, how does that roll off? It's almost like you're... You've taken them on this journey, and now they're going through the exit door, and they're sort of leaving the building. It's like, what's the, you know, when they walk out of that world, what's the feeling that they left? It's like, whoa, that was brilliant. You know, that was great. That was exciting. Or is it like, oh, I'm glad that's over, you know? Um, so really, really spend extra time. I, I spent a lot of extra time at the beginning and the end of the book. In fact, I, I spent more time on those than probably anything else. I mean, I agonized over... Uh, first paragraph, last paragraph, the sentence, even the last sentence, I just spent so much time going back to it, back to it, back to it. I just really wanted that, that last impression to be the other one. Editing and review. So uh, so screenwriters, once you've, once you've created a draft, once you've written a draft of your novel, um, I love getting beta readers, getting people to read your book and give you feedback. Um, I did this. I, it took me a year and a half to write the Scout, and um, and once it was done, I went back and I did an edit on it. And then I had um, I asked friends and, and people uh, to beta read it, and I offered them. I first of all, I gave them permission not to like it, and this is a tough one because nobody wants to hear that their material stinks. <laughs> nobody wants to say, "Hey, read my book," and then the person reads it like, "This is terrible," you know. Uh, or like, yeah, it was really good. I liked it. Um, you know, you know, hang up on you. Um, so give them permission not to like it. Just give, give them permission to say, you know what, I really didn't care for it. Don't take it personally. Just just allow, give them the, the shot to do that. Um, and then ask yourself what's in it for them. Offer them something. Like I offered them gift cards because I figured, like, well, you know, um, you should be grateful that I'm giving you the opportunity to read my masterpiece. You know, <laughs> bask in my glory for two weeks. <laughs> Uh, no, it's like, hey, you know, if you will for me, I'll give you a $50 gift card at, you know, Starbucks, iTunes, or Amazon, or something, and tell me what you want, give them something. And what's interesting is I had 12 beta readers, and um, half of them took the cards, and their half said, you know what, don't worry about it, it's cool, I'll read it anyway. And they did. So, but it's always nice to offer them something that makes them feel like you're valuing their time, because, you know, some people are busy, and, you know, to give them an, an entire book, um, I was 100,000 words, 417 pages, so I, I, I gave them like six weeks, you know, I just said, hey, if you have time, can you please read this for me? And they, every one of them got back to me in, uh, in time. Um, a couple of them read it read in a couple days, so these are some pointers on, on doing that. Um, 
So what came out of this? So I, you know, as a writer, now that I've now that I've transitioned to the book, and I'm not I'm not writing screenplays anymore. Um, here's what's here's what's come out of it for me. Um, since then, three anthology deals were paid, and I still retain the rights to resell as standalone. So the synchronic, the tales of tin foil, and I'm writing a story right now for a, a book series called The Future Chronicles that Samuel Peralta's put together, and the one I'm doing is the Cyborg Chronicles. I think Dragon Chronicles just came out. Those have been doing really well. Hugh Howie and Peter Codger and some other authors have been have been heavily involved in those in those anthologies. So that's that's hey, get paid for writing a short story. I you know that's that's good you know okay. Um, one novel deal with Wonder Man Media for the Apocalypse Weird book, a growing readership, and um, this hasn't fully sort of solidified yet, but. I do have a, there is a uh, film producer that is, is seriously wanting to option this book uh, for films. So the irony being that I've pounded out the screenplay for all these years and there's the potential, it's not a guarantee, no, nothing's a guarantee, but there's the potential that there's somebody actually interested in reading or optioning this book. Um, what I found is that uh, as you talk to people, uh, especially in the industry, it's very easy to become just one of the screenwriters out there, one of the hundreds and thousands that bang on their door every day, read my script, read my script, read my <clears> script. <throat> and these guys have a fleet of assistants and people to keep you away, to just, you know, to turn you away, like, I don't want to read your script. But it's interesting how the conversation changed when you, when you mention that you've written a book, you've written some short stories, and actually had people stumble. Oh, really? Well, where, you know, can I download it? Where is it? You know, I'm taking a flight over to uh, to London. I can read it on the flight. They'll download your, your book on their Kindle, or they get it, you get a print copy. Or um, the uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the reviews. I was going to tell you about the reviews. This is the other reward. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to break my thought there, but let me just touch on this real quick. Rewards to writer are reviews. Okay, this one, I have no idea who this person was. I have no idea that the username, I looked them up to see, is this somebody I know? And I, I didn't. But yeah, okay. Um, this person basically, uh, Thanksgiving, looking forward to some Pepto and a nap after dinner. I see if I enjoy the sample, I go back, uh, download the rest of the book. I got about 20% of the sample, Pepto forgotten, nap abandoned, bought the book, read 78% of the book before I finally fell asleep at 2 a.m., then finished the rest of the book this morning. I tell you this little story to demonstrate the levels, which is what grab my interest in women. Go, I really wanted to have them in now. <laughs> okay. But you know what I'm saying? Like that, that means a lot to me. That means a lot. You know, it's like, wow, somebody stayed up late to read my book. I, you know, it, it's so that's another one of the rewards. Um, and of course I've gotten some batteries that we're gonna use that. That's the way that's the way it goes. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say, if you, if you can novelize your script, if you can take your script, turn it into a novel, um, you have the potential, number one, to, to, um, to create that very thing that you hope to create, to build a readership, to get people to engage with you, and to read your material. And it, it, it's, it's even, and with film people, it's a little disarming because again, you're not you're not pounding your script down their throat. You're not trying to get them to read your script. You're just telling them, "I've written a couple of books. I've got some short stories and some anthologies. It's enough to get them to wonder, like, I wonder if this person has something and they might actually read you." Um, I want to talk quickly too about the audiobook option here, and this is and I'm talking for people who might just self-publish, but audiobooks. This is a very real thing, the Audio Creation Exchange. This gives you a chance to, um, to audition people to read your book for an audio book. I can't tell you how amazing it is. I started with print and with digital. And I can, I'll, just for grins, I'll tell you guys my numbers, just so you know realistically what I sold. So I published the book in October of 2013. Uh, to date, I've sold 2,300 ebook copies. I've sold 100 print copies and audiobooks, 220 audiobooks. Um, not gangbuster, blockbuster numbers, but not bad. I'm just stepping into this game. Um, 
I, I suspect, so if I count the readers that have read the short stories in, in the other anthologies that have been published in Synchronic has sold over 10,000 copies. So people are reading me. They're reading, you know, that's the whole point is to build a readership. But the audio creation exchange, a lot of people are listening to books now because people spend a lot of time in the car. They're commuting, they're, you know, uh, they're busy. So um, look up the ACX, the audio creation exchange option, because what you can do is you can put out a call for an audition for your book. It will, you know, if somebody's interested, a producer or a narrator, they'll send you uh, a sample. You send them like 15 pages of your book, they send you a sample back. And then you have a decision. You can do um, uh, pay out. You can, you can do a deal where you just pay them for their time in producing the book, where you do a royalty split and you're not out of pocket anything. I, I chose to do the royalty split uh, with this particular gentleman, a guy in New York who does uh, audiobooks and he did a great job. So I wasn't out of pocket anything. I wasn't. Um, you know, I wasn't trying to produce an audio book. I let him do the whole thing, and, and it's up there. So I had I had a guy, at a work a coworker one time, say, "Well, I want to read your book, but I'm just you know kind of slow." It's like, "Well, I have an audio book." He's like, "You do?" So he downloaded it on the spot on his phone and started listening. So the next few days, he had the earbuds, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm on chapter 20." You know, <laughs> I'm like, "This is so cool," you know. So um, so definitely look into that when you when you start to get into this. Um, okay, and I think. Okay, well, I think that's that's it. There's uh, there's still a few minutes left here. We can do some Q and A. But anyway, I I hope this was I hope this was helpful or interesting or maybe even inspiring. Um, but uh, certainly uh, we have a couple things to do. But I but we'll do Q and A first. Okay, so yes. Okay, just two questions. Uh, uh, question. So when you're doing the, the first question, at by two. When you're switching over from final draft. Uh, whatever it is, number of them. And you want to go, what format do you put in? What's your, what's your font? And how many uh, about pages should you have realistically? What, what font do you switch to from Final Draft to whatever? And what program did you use? Um, I used, um, well, when I wrote the Scout, I used Word, Microsoft Word. And there are a couple of authors in the house that might be able to answer in terms of manuscript form. Joe, do you want to? Maybe just are, are you asking how do you format it, or are you asking what compared to com, compared to from final draft, what what do you, do you use to you know? Uh, I, I write it either Word or Scrivener in terms of uh, actual software. Times New Roman. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. Times New Roman, Corey and New. They don't care. Yeah, they don't, don't give a wing gig, sir. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <free. laughs> <laughs> no Second, no comic stands, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Second question: when you, when you finish it, you electronic, uh, you electronically copyright it, uh, whatever with the uh, whatever. Do you did you just get give it to a um, uh, couple of pages or whatever to the literary agents who look at new? Novelist, or did you submit query letters out first? Okay, so what I did was for this, I, I actually I actually ended up self-publishing that book, The Scout, and okay. I'll tell you why. I, I I did send out some query letters, and the process was taking a real long time, and I had the book done. I went to Worldcon in 2013 because the the Ray Bradbury film, the Kaleidoscope film, was playing at the festival, and and I was and this book was just about to come out. And that's where I met, um, I met some great uh, authors. I met some published and, and self-published. I met Hugh Howley and Michael Bunker and all, all kinds of these cool guys. And I just made a decision there that I didn't necessarily want to wait um, for the queries and the other things because it could, I mean, there was an agent there and he was very frank. He said, look, realistically, if you send out queries and stuff like that, by the time it, it, it's, we read it and if we like it and we submit it, um, it's, it's you know, and then somebody actually picks it up and then publishes the book, it could be a couple of years. So, so, so you chose to self-publish? I chose to self-publish. How does one self-publish? Uh, it's very easy. I, Amazon um, is sort of the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I know there's iBooks and Kobo and Nook, but really Amazon is, is taking the lion's share in terms of, of the way people buy their e-books. Um, and it's very simple. I mean, <coughs> if you do a simple Google search, it's called Kindle Direct Publishing. That's where you start. You look that up, and they tell you exactly how to do it step by step. So it's a matter of getting artwork, getting your um, document formatted uh, properly for an electronic form. Um, they also have a print 
um, a print farm, which is some um, create space. And it just requires some formatting and some time and things like that. It's, it's things you can actually do yourself, but there are some people that I have do the formatting for me just to make sure it was. But you'll glad looking back on it, you'll glad that you self published, you didn't submit query letters, look for you know a, a major publisher, whatever random. I mean, it, I, you know, granted, I would have loved if, if I had gotten, you know, like, hey, major publisher, we're interested. That would have been brilliant, but I didn't want to wait. You know what I mean? Like, I yes, just look, the book's something. done, I've got people who want to read it, I'm just going to put it out there. And like I said, not huge numbers, but I've sold, you know, 2,300 copies of that ebook. You know, I'm still selling books every month, so it's like, I'm happy that I did it that way because it got me the gig on Synchronic, it got me the Apocalypse Weird deal, got me the Tales of Tinfoil, and it got me the, um, uh, the, the Cyborg Chronicles. Because most people don't know, but that Fifty Shades of Grey, that started out as a message board vanity project. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. 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 Twilight Fantasy. Okay, yes. Um, so, also two questions. Um, first off, how would you go about approaching an author who you wanted to uh, uh, s a screenplay their novel, like to do a chapter of it as an example and just say, hey, I really like your book. I, did, I was looking at doing this and would like your opinion of it. Um, or is that a little bit too much? And then secondly, uh, going through this, I heard Neuromancer by William Gibson was has been considered unfilmable. Would you agree with that? <laughs> have you ever read it? I have not read it. All right. <laughs> yes, okay. Keep that. I was, it, it was one of those things I was like, I really like this. I'd love right. to write it out. And I started hearing more and more references. I think because a lot of it is internet based, you know, yeah. uh, his vision of the web. I so. think I think as far as adapting someone else's book, you know, if you're a fan of a book or something, I, I think, I mean, that's going to depend because chances are if that author is with a major publisher, they're going to want to know who are you. What are your yeah, sure. so yeah. If you want to adapt it, I mean, are you are you going to produce it, or is this just sort of like a hobby? So, I, you know, you have to you have to kind of weigh that out. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, but, you know, I think in the case of, of Stephen King and, and the thing with King and Ray Bradbury, because they were both short stories, and because, um, at least with Ray, we had some very uh, personal ties with him, people that knew him very, very well. And that's, that's how we were able to pull that off. With Stephen King, um, Jay just took a shot and, and shot the film. He was just a big fan of King anyway. And thankfully it did pay off. And, and it's, it seems like King is, is very generous when it comes to these dollar deals. He's extremely supportive of young filmmakers and people that are up and coming. And so that, that just worked out organically. Yeah. Yes? Where did you get the graphics for your cover art of the scout? Um, uh, I actually made this myself. This is I did this in um, After Effects since I'm a um, uh, video film editor and I do visual effects as well. I basically designed the cover and just put it together. Um, and all these other covers were done by other people, but uh, but this one, yeah, I was like, you know what, I got to design this one because I, I I've got the, the concept in my head of what I want to see, and I'll just I'll just put it together and, and push it out. <coughs> One other. Yes. Um, recommended or in your experience, best technology as far as uh, sharing your uh, work with people, either uh, publishers or producers, is it, you know, would you say just go to the, uh, the Kindle Direct Publishing and then you can give them the link to it um, at, in the free market or? I'm yeah, it's very easy to do. It's so easy. I mean, anymore you go to your author, if you, if you look at my author page, I mean, there, there's, there's shares. I mean, you go to your book page, like share this on. Facebook, Twitter, you know, you can share your book anywhere. I mean, it's the social media has made it very, very easy to get the word out. And so it's just a matter of publishing, not just a book, but a really good book, you know, and again, it's like, it's like emphasizing the writing and the time and putting in, you know, there to, to, to really put together a, a great book. But after that, um, social media and Amazon are making it very, very easy. Now that being said, it is, becoming a very cozy, actually more than cozy, um, landscape out there. It's kind of like when YouTube first came out, it was sort of like this secret thing, like, hey, there's YouTube, and you could kind of put up your stuff. I did a, like, I'll give you an example. Um, I directed a web series, actually one of the first web shows ever produced in 2007, early 2007. It was right after the Lonely Girl thing broke. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. Okay. So shortly after that, uh, a friend, a writer friend and I uh, shot and produced a web series called The Dirty Bomb Diaries. And it was all about this woman who gets trapped in her home and, and a bomb goes off in her, um, in her neighborhood and she's sort of trapped in her home. And so we, it's like 16 episodes on YouTube. 
And at the time, YouTube really wasn't that crowded and web shows weren't really, nobody really knew what a web show was. But as a result, we ended up with over two million views on the series because we were very visible. Everybody could find us. It was one of the, it was a unique thing. Now, uh, the web show thing is kind of becoming, you know, in the same way that the screenplay thing is like everybody and their dog has a web show, you know. Um, and YouTube, it's a lot harder to find it's people. Be so. where that's where pilot season is going to start. Right, exactly. So you really have to work at promoting yourself, uh, you know. But but Amazon makes it easy in a lot of these. With social media nowadays, you just you just have to really put your hand in there and work at it. Um, but it can certainly be done, you know. And there have been people that have been very very successful at it. Yes. We've got five minutes left, so if you want to do the oh sure, let's do the let's do the. Um, Let's do the drawing. Uh, but does any, any other questions? Other questions? Yes. Talk about more. When you're actually just doing the adaptation, are you just sitting there with like a printed copy, or do you have two up on the screen, what you're writing into the novel, like your screenplay, and you just kind of side by side, looking back and forth? No, you know what I'll do? I'll actually go through the script. Um, well, the thing is, like in, in the case of the scout, I mean, I knew the script backward and forward. I mean, I wrote it, so I already had it in my head, but I made some notes. I just took some time, and I broke it down, and I started to figure out especially in the third act. I hated the third act in the script that I had. And so I just spent some time um, thinking about the beats, the story beats. Like, this does not make sense. This has to work. And so I spent a lot of time just making notes separately. So I really wasn't looking at them side by side. I just kind of stepped aside from both and sat down and just focused on the story and just working out the beats and, and what was going on with the character. And once I had that, then I just went straight to the book and I just started writing the chapters if that makes sense. Sort of, sort of outlining, as I said, chapter 50, you know, this happened, boom, 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 and sort of bullet point it and find those beats within the chapter and then just start to, start to fill it out from there. Yeah? Okay. All you. <laughs> Do you want to draw? Oh, sure. Okay, so yeah, so the giveaway. So um, let's... Okay, so I'm going to draw for the signed copy, and then as soon as we're done, I will I will sign it for you, personalize the signed print book, and then uh, okay, so for the print book. No cheating now. Okay. <laughs> Kimberly May M E Y S, is that right? Hey, how are you? Yay! <laughs> Good. All right, good. Okay, and now for the, um, for the e book. Barry McHormuth. Hormuth? Barry? Barry? Oops. What? Is he not here? Oh, man. Oh, must be present man. to win. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Okay. All right. Let's try another one. Okay. Maryam Abdullah? Yes! Yay. All right, the ebook for you. Yay. All right, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you guys came. I, I, just, I had a great time here. I hope this was informative uh, or inspirational or something in between. <laughs> um, uh, yeah.